Hey everybody, how's it going? Happy weekend to everyone. Um, as I've said in other reviews, that slasher films, specifically 80 slashers, are my bread and butter. I absolutely love 80 slasher films. I and I attribute that to, you know, I started watching Halloween and the Friday 13th series and Nightmare on Elm Street and stuff when I was like five, six years old, seven years old. And that's probably a huge reason why it's my favorite subgenre of horror because it's what got me into the genre in the first place. And I'm gonna talk about now and in the next few videos as I'm doing the all four movies throughout the night and into tomorrow. And I'm talking about the Sleepaway Camp franchise and starting obviously with 1983's original Sleepaway Camp. Director Robert Hiltzik, I don't know anything else he's done. Uh, I didn't bother looking it up either. So if anyone knows anything else he's done that's good, leave it in the comments. I'll check it out. And it's starring Felisa Rose as Angela. And her performance in this movie now, I've always gone back and forth on this. She's a child actor, obviously, at the time. So I don't know how much of this is a performance or how much of it is just her. Like, the way, just her, naturally how she was as a child like this, or a you know, young kid when she did this movie. But either way, like, if it was a performance absolutely amazing just the the way she looks and her stare now she just always looks so frightened and timid and everything amazing and if it's the opposite and it wasn't really a performance and it was just how she is man they got lucky casting Felissa Rose because she just fit perfectly as the role of Angela now I've I was born in 1988 this movie came out in 83. I would kill, no camp counselors, but I would kill <laughs> to go back in time and see this movie in the theaters just to see the whole rest of the audience's reaction to the ending of this movie. And for everyone who's seen this movie, which is a lot of people, it is such a classic in the slasher genre, and for damn good reason, Everyone knows the ending to this movie, even if they haven't seen it. They still know it because it's such an infamous ending and one of the most disturbing endings in a slasher film ever. And I would absolutely kill to see an audience reaction to it, like for the first time in 1983. Absolutely, like, would love to see that. So, there's a, the score in this movie. Very good. I love the score in this movie. It's creepy. It, it, it just sets the atmosphere and the tone very well for the film, especially like the, the ending and everything, the music and that and stuff. But we'll get to the ending and everything. But um, so we have the opening scene. It's in, I think it's 1975 or something. I wrote it down probably. In 1975. And we have Angela and Peter, our brother and sister, and they're with their dad on a boat in uh, the lake at Camp Arawak. And I love the name of the camp in this movie. Arawak, it's just like, it rolls off the tongue so well. Arawak. Arawak. <laughs> I love the, na the name of this camp. Camp Arawak. Such a cool name. And the kids are like playing a prank on their dad and they like flip the boat over that they're on and he's like, oh, you're such a little pranksters and stuff. And then we have these other kids that are you know older like i you can't tell how old any of the kids or young adults are in this movie like they seem like they're maybe like 12 13 years old something like that but they have two people that are driving a speedboat and pulling another girl like on a, a surfboard from behind and the girl ends up saying that she wants to uh, try at controlling the boat and driving it and stuff you drive a boat, is that the term for it? I don't, I've never operated a boat, so <laughs> I have no idea what I'm talking about. But she's driving the boat. She ends up taking over and starts operating the boat here. And 
they end up how do they not see that these two kids and the father and the boat that's turned over from such a far distance come on <laughs> like they, it's it, they're very far away like when they first start heading towards them and they didn't see them until like it was like too late to stop and yeah i know the guy the, the kid like when he's trying to turn the wheel and stuff he like accelerates the boat but still like come on they didn't see that that that's a little silly but they end up crashing into the boat and end up killing this the father and the son which leaves angela is the only one alive and they the the guy who's with them on the beach and calls to uh, the father and says like the doctor's gonna be here or something we gotta go soon and stuff this guy has like no reaction after he sees and we find out later in a weird fucking flashback that like the father and him were like were lovers and stuff like that it's, it's such a random flashback but so this is his lover apparently and there is like no reaction he doesn't not jump in the water immediately to like check on him and the kids or anything like that the girl who was riding the surfboard that was being pulled by the boat is a million times more terrified and screaming for help for this, these kids and the father and stuff than the lover on the beach like <laughs> he does nothing he just like you get a shot of him staring like like oh shit that's it and while the girl in the water is screaming, somebody help us somebody help the kids like God, that's just a little ridiculous too i mean obviously it's an 80 slasher there's going to be a ton of stuff that i'm picking apart in this but i absolutely love this film and i absolutely love two and three the sequels to this i have not seen return to sleepaway camp because i have heard nothing but just dreadful things about it but I will watch and review it for the first time if I can find it somewhere for, uh, streaming for free. I know all three are on Tubi, the first three. And um, I'm even, I'm halfway through the second one right now. So um, they'll be up by the morning, the all three of them. And then I'll see if I can find Return to Sleep Away Camp, which I'm not looking forward to. But for completionist reasons, I will try to get that one done too. So it cuts to like eight years later to 1983 and we meet Aunt Martha. I don't still not, don't know what to think about this character to this day. Like I probably first saw this movie when I was 12, 13 years old, something like that. And I don't know, man, she's such a hard character to describe. <laughs> like, like Aunt Martha, man, like it's, she's like Mary Poppins, like on nitrous oxide, like on <laughs> laughing gas. Like she's just, the way she talks and she just like talks to herself like, and she'll be like, oh, well, we, we can't have that happen. No, no, of course we can't, of course. Like she's so weird, man. And then she mentions that she's a doctor. I would never go to this doctor <laughs> like if i don't care if i was dying from the most uncurable just like crazy illness or infection or something like that and this was the only woman who could save my life i would she walks into the into the waiting room and calls me in and i meet her i would immediately say no you know what i feel much better i'm gonna just you know i'm, I'm a bounce <laughs> <laughs> like no way would I let this woman ever <laughs> do any type of medical examination or anything on me no way <laughs> she is batshit insane and we find out that she took in Angela after uh, her father and brother were killed in that accident and she ends up sending Angela and her son Ricky so Angela's cousin to Camp Arawak which Ricky has been going to for a few years and Angela and Nimbers went. This is her first time going to camp. And Angela, obviously, is, she's a very shy girl. She's very timid. She doesn't speak at all until, like, a little later in the film. And like I said, I don't know how, if it was her performance or if it's just her. But either way, like, it, it's creepy, man. Like, it, she just has this creepiness to her that just 
it's unsettling, like it's weird. But she's still like adorable in a way. Like it's 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 very strange. <laughs> like it's like every time I see this movie, it's like, oh, I want an adorable girl, man. But it's like, but then you, like you see her stare and stuff like that. She just like stares into like the abyss, <laughs> and it's like this girl's fucking creepy, man. <laughs> Like, it's, it's like a paradox with her. And she's constantly getting bullied as soon as she gets to the camp. by Especially by the Judy, the camp tramp. <laughs> what a bitch this woman, this girl is, man. And Meg, the other, she's like the counselor and stuff. Like, for the girls, like the girls' counselor. What bitches these people are. <laughs> they are terrible fucking girls. And... They end up having the other counselor, the other female counselor, and the head camp counselor, Ronnie, which I like Ronnie's character a lot in this movie. What a nice guy, man. Like, a genuinely nice guy. And him and the other female counselor are always trying to, like, protect Angela and get her whatever she needs, make her feel comfortable and stuff. I love Ronnie's character in this movie. Like, and he... He does a pretty good performance, actually. Like, it's nothing amazing, but it's, you know, it's not terrible like a lot, like most of the performances in this movie are. I really like Ronnie. And so all the campers end up coming um, off the buses and stuff, and they get there, and we meet this, oh, God, man, the cook. This pedophile molester just evil fucking cook and he makes these comments like with the other the black cook and stuff and like three other people around him and all the kids are coming off and he's like man man like look at all these young fresh chickens and he's like what where i come from we call them baldies and stuff and and the the black cook just like says like they're too young to even know what you're talking about and then he says something else and the black cook just laughs it off <laughs> like you hear this person saying this repugnant shit about being attracted to these young young underage girls and you just laugh it off <laughs> Like, it's absolutely insane. <laughs> like, nobody acts like that. Get out of here. So, this guy, this cook, would have been murdered, like, so many years before this movie takes place. Or just the way that he is. And Ronnie end up, ends up coming up to Angela and says that she, uh, he hears that she hasn't been eating much since she's been there. And um, takes her into the kitchen, says that, uh, you know, we'll try to find you something to eat. We'll bring you to Artie. That's the cook's, the pedophile's name. Says, we'll take you to Artie. She'll be okay and stuff. She'll, she'll be okay? Like, you, how long? He's been working at this camp for, like, years. It, they, it, they make that, like, pretty apparent. Like, it's not his first year here. And he has been around this cook, and he doesn't pick up on any of the sick shit that this guy is into and thinks and says says just wide openly like i said to like the black cook and the other two people around i would never bring anybody around this cook absolutely insane <laughs> like ridiculous and then they bring uh, brings angela into the kitchen and introduces him introduces her to the cook and just um, and says get some get her something to eat she hasn't been eating doesn't like your cooking and stuff and just creepily puts his hand on her and says, oh, we'll find something for you and something you like. Maybe in the pantry. You never know what you can find in the pantry. Oh, dude, it makes me fucking sick every time this guy opens his mouth. Every time. Like, so disgusting. And he brings Angela into the pantry and starts, like, unbuttoning his... Taking his belt off and stuff, and Ricky, the cousin, ends up coming in and saying what's going on and stuff, and ends up the two of them run out and stuff, and then we see the pedophile cook like on a chair, like stirring a soup or stew or whatever it is. It's like boiling, scalding hot water, and we see the killer come and just pull the chair out and he's like off balance and stuff on like over this scalding pot of water whatever the hell it is and i never noticed it until like this viewing but 
he says, like, hey, kid, like, what are you doing? I thought to myself, I said, I never noticed that, but, like, it kind of just gives away completely that the killer is a kid at the camp. And not just, not a counselor, not, like, a, it's just some random killer. Like, it, it gives it away real quick, and I don't know how I never picked up on that. But, and, I mean, they they don't really try at all to hide the fact that Angel is the killer in this movie. Like, not one bit. Like, they try to make it like Ricky is the killer, but come on. Like, you know, just even the first time you see this movie, you're like, yeah, come on. Like, Angel is killing all these people. Like, for sure. Like, 100%. <laughs> like, and it, it's still fine. It still works. It's still, like, I don't have a problem with it, really. It's, it's just an observation that I made. So the killer knocks the cook off the chair and he gets severely burned and stuff. Just the, the pot falls onto him and he's scalding and burns his face and body. And this guy gets to live while everyone else gets murdered, including those little kids in the woods later at, near the ending. But this motherfucker gets to live? Fuck you. <laughs> Like, the, fuck you. That's all I have to say. Like, he gets to live. If I was around this guy and saw him doing and saying the things that he did, I would beat this guy, like, Gaspar nose, irreversible, like, fire extinguisher to the face repeatedly until his face was a fucking pancake. <laughs> like, absolutely. Like, and this guy gets to live. Yeah, he's badly, severely burned, he deserves absolute death. <laughs> like, what an evil character. <laughs> like, and Jesus, if he gets to live, come on. That's insane. So then Mel, the owner, the creepy old guy, it's like, this is like a camp of pedophiles. Like, <laughs> it's so weird. It's like half the people here are like pedophiles. And just so weird. This guy, Mel, and I've seen this actor you know, a lot of things. I don't remember his name, and I can't really think of anything else I've seen him in, but I know I've seen him before. He was in a decent amount of things. And so he doesn't want the, the cook's accident, as he calls it, um, being spread throughout the camp and anything. He doesn't want the parents finding out. So he basically, like, bribes the black cook and the rest of the cooking crew and stuff and said, hey, you're the head cook now, an extra $50 a week doesn't sound bad, and 15 a week extra for the rest of you. And they're all like, no, that's good, sir, that's good. And like, <laughs> just Mel is such a scumbag in this movie. And we see Angela just keep getting bullied and keep getting bullied. And Ricky and his friend Paul try beating up these people, the kids that are picking on Angela. And Paul starts being very kind and starts befriending Angela and is the person who gets her to open her mouth for the first time when he says goodnight to her and she says goodnight back. And he's like super excited and he's like, goodnight, and just like runs out, like runs out of the fucking building. It's cute though, I mean, just seeing their little dynamic and stuff and how she opens up around him, it's kind of cute. And judy the tramp from this camp is just like completely jealous every time that she sees paul with angela because she's just thinking to herself like this mute little girl and stuff like that and what the hell does he see in her and i think i think they said that like ricky the cousin used to date and they're like had a thing with this girl the tramp the camp tramp judy that's my name for her, camp tramp judy <laughs> <laughs> and she ends up um, getting jealous like every time that she sees them together and we have the next killer we have the boy and the girl in the boat and people just love turning boats over and pranking people like that in this movie <laughs> we get that in the opening scene with the kids we get that in this scene with the boy just flipping it over and saying that she, the girl has her hand in the water and she says oh it's, uh, there's water snakes in there and if you keep your hand in too long she ends up leaving and then the boat's turned over and then we just see somebody's head come up while he's under the, the canoe or whatever it is the boat and just drowns him in the water the, the kills in this movie there's not a lot of like gore or like 
Like, there's not a lot of, like, on-screen, like, really good kills in this movie. But the aftermath of the kills and, like, the bodies afterwards and stuff, there are great effects. Like, really good. Like, when they find, when the, the counselor finds the drowned kid's uh, body the next day, and it's just, like, totally bloated, and the fucking snake's coming out of the mouth. It's awesome. Looks so good. And... Mel, again, wants to cover this up and says it's an accident and that the boy was just swimming and ended up drowning. And I, I wrote, again, awesome shot of the corpse, like with the snake coming out. It, it looks really creepy. And the, there's a cop that comes. And it's Mel and the cop and Ronnie uh, talking about what happened to the kid. And Mel's the one just insisting it's an accident and stuff. And the cop and Ronnie are, like, not believing it they're like and ronnie even says to the cop before he leaves like i remember that kid being a real good swimmer and they have suspicions already and mel is just an evil fucking guy <laughs> that just wants all these murders covered up as they keep on going and the cops makes a comment that we're like when he's saying um that he felt that Mel says that he must have just fallen out of the boat and hit his head and drowned or something. And he's like, no, I didn't see any bruises or anything like that, but I'm not an expert on anything. What? You're a cop. Like it's your, that's your job is to, <laughs> is to like solve crimes and stuff and like figure out what happened. It's such a weird line. I don't know. I, I caught it on like a, my last rewatch of this movie. And then again, this time, I, it, as soon as he said it, I was like, you're a cop, like, you're not an expert on it, like, like, this is your expertise, you're a cop, like, this is your job, is to, like, figure out what the hell happened at crime scenes, I, it's, just, it's such a weird line, and so Paul invites Angela to, like, the movie night they have, and walks her back to her cabin, and gives her, like, a good, good night kiss, and asks for another good night kiss, and it's cute, like I said, like, their little dynamic together is, is adorable in this movie, and, um, she says that immediately, but she, you can tell Angela isn't comfortable, she, after they kiss again, like, she's like, I have to go inside now, and she just, like, goes into her cabin, and Judy comes along, Camp Tramp Judy, and tries flirting with Paul. What a bitch this girl is, man. And I, I always get so happy when I see her murdered later. <laughs> and we have this crazy scene where the boys are putting shaving cream on the sleeping boy's hand and, like, puts a sock near his nose and he hits himself in the face and gets shaving cream all over his face. And this kid just pulls a fucking knife out. <laughs> <laughs> and just like starts like threatening the kids and shit like that. They are the boys and stuff. Like, what's he doing with this knife? And then like the council comes in and takes it from him. At a total underreaction, and like, what are you doing with that? Give me that. You'll get it back at the end of the summer, maybe. So, like, dude, this kid just pulled a fucking knife out on all these other young kids, and that's all you have to say? Like, give me that knife. You'll get it back maybe at the end of the summer. Come on, <laughs> ridiculous. And uh, that's just so stupid. And then Judy has a scene that she slaps um, the nice female counselor who's always trying to help Angela. Slaps her hard as shit right in the face and she's not immediately sent home from this camp. <laughs> just another ridiculous observation. Anyone who's seen other reviews of mine like so far, I just love picking movies apart. Just stupid little things and stuff that like most people don't notice or that things I'll just notice on rewatches and be like, come on. Like, it's like my favorite thing to do with movies. It's I've been doing it my whole life. I just love picking apart stupid stuff in movies. So that's why I go off on little tangents all the time because I'm constantly just watching these films and just, what is that? What's this line? What the hell is that about? I, I love that. It's one of my fucking hobbies. I love picking apart movies. So then these guys that are throwing water balloons at Angela. Off, they're on like the roof. They're throwing water balloons. And Ricky, the cousin, comes to a rescue again. And starts screaming, cursing at him, saying, I'll kill you and stuff like that. And then we see one of the boys that was doing that, throwing the water balloons at her, going to the bathroom, taking a shit. And the killer comes, puts a broomstick between the, 
the stalls and doors and stuff so it can't be opened and then goes around back to the window and cuts the screen open and puts a fucking beehive in the stall with this guy taking a dump and he just gets stung to death man and like like i said you don't see anything really like on screen but again afterwards like the aftermath of it and seeing like his body there and all the bees all over his face awesome looks so cool it, it, what a cool shot and can you imagine like that, like after, after the movie ends what we don't see and the parents find out that their son was killed at this camp and when people would ask them oh my god what happened to your son and they'd have to say well he was taking a shit and he got stung to death by bees <laughs> I don't know. I thought that I just, I can't imagine having to say that to anyone. Like if if they ask, like well, how did your kid die? Like I would just make something up. I would just be like oh, he tripped down the stairs. It was tragic, you know. And that's it. Like I would not say what happened to him because it's just ridiculous what happened to this kid. And. Mel thinks that Ricky is the killer, and this makes no sense to me. It never did. Why is Mel so hell-bent on thinking that Ricky is the killer? Like, was Ricky... Ricky's been coming here for years. As Was he, like, killing people all the previous years, and Mel knew about it and never did anything, and now he just knows he's a killer? Like, there's no explanation for why. He's just hell-bent that this kid is the killer for some reason why because he defends his cousin every time that she's getting severely bullied and pushed around for that's the only reason that makes no sense like that's absolutely ridiculous like he's so hell-bent on knowing and thinking that ricky is the one doing these killings for what like, like I said, because he constantly is picking fights with the people that are bullying his cousin. Any good cousin would do that. Like, any, I have many cousins. Anyone was fucking with my cousins like that, I would immediately come to their rescue and try to help them. Like, and that would make me a fucking killer to this guy, apparently. So weird. And we have Paul and Angela go to the lake, and they start making out. And she's very uncomfortable again, as you can tell. And that's when we get this weird flashback scene of we see uh, Peter, the, the Angela's brother, who died in the beginning of the movie, and Angela like laughing and like looking in like a doorway and seeing their father with his lover and stuff, like having sex in the bed. Like I don't know why they put that scene in there. Like, it's just such a random scene. I mean, I guess, like, it's, like, calling back to, like, why she's uncomfortable, like, around men and stuff like that. And obviously, at the end, you know, we know exactly why. But, I mean, I guess it makes a little bit of sense. But it's, I always think that it's such a weird, like, flashback or scene to throw in the movie. Like, it, you cut this out of the movie, and it doesn't miss a beat, like, at all. And Angela freaks out after that, like thinking about this memory or whatever, this flashback thing, and she just runs off. So then Angela catches Judy and Paul kissing uh, like a day or two later and runs away. You can tell she's upset. And Paul goes and apologizes for kissing Judy. And Judy comes, this bitch that she is, and her and Meg just take Angela and they're saying why don't you want to go for a swim you never go swimming and they pick her up and they just throw her in the water as she's screaming like for her life what bitches man like it's so it's so like disheartening to watch like this I mean obviously you know that she's the killer Angela so it's like you can't feel that bad but like your first time seeing this movie and not knowing she's the killer, which again, I said, is so apparent that she is. That, like, they hardly try to hide it. But, like, for, I guess, the people who don't pick up on that and just, like, don't suspect her as the killer, it's disheartening, man, to see the way that she is so incredibly tortured and bullied in this movie. It absolutely, it, it's so disgusting to see. And, um... So they throw in the water and Ricky comes and rescues her while Mel's like holding him and saying, I got you and stuff. And still hell bent thinking that he's the killer, which again makes no sense 
to me at all. And she ends up getting her out of the water and he swears that they won't get away with this and that we'll get, I'll get revenge on, you know, these people that are torturing and bullying uh, Angela. And Meg and Mel, Meg is the bitchy counselor and the old ass owner of the camp, Mel, have something together and like they go to dinner like or they have a plan to go to dinner or something like that and like what the hell is this woman doing going trying to fuck this old dude and like i said like between the cook and mel it's like a fucking pedophile heaven at this camp like it's it's so sick like this is a disturbing film like if like like of all the things i've been mentioning and stuff this movie's disturbing and it's weird because i actually prefer sleepaway camp 2 on happy campers that's my favorite in the series i just like the campiness of it and pamela springsteen's performance in two and three is just so good but obviously this one is a lot more serious and a lot less campy and i go back and forth on them like i love this movie but i absolutely adore unhappy campers and teenage wasteland too i like all three of these movies like i said i haven't seen return to sleepaway camp so i don't know but all i've heard is terrible terrible things so if i get to see it you will hear my thoughts on how terrible it probably is <laughs> and um so they plan on going to dinner and like meeting up for dinner at Mel's place, uh, him and Meg. And Meg goes to take a shower and the killer comes. And this is like one of the only like on screen, like bloody death so kills that we get in the movie. And uh, the killer just through the back of the shower, just with a big ass knife, just sticks her in the back and then drags the knife down in the blood. Great kill. It looks really cool. The, the blood is great. Like it, it really cool kill. One of my favorites in the movies. So, Paul tries apologizing again to Angela for what happened between him and Judy kissing and stuff. And she tells him to meet him at the lake that night. And we have these small children. Like, they're like the youngest kids at the camp. Like, they're, they're young kids. And they go on this, like, camping trip overnight with their counselor. And there's, like, like six, seven of them or something like that. And two of them, like, one of them starts saying he's cold. He wants to go back to the main camp. And the, the counselor's like, just go to sleep. And he's trying to sleep and stuff. And then another one chimes in. He's like, I want to go back too and stuff. And he's like, all right. And he ends up getting up and driving the two of them back to the main camp. And then we see a POV shot of the killer coming and picking up a hatchet. And man, what a crazy scene when we see this counselor come back and the rest of the little kids are brutally fucking like hatcheted up just butchered and you don't see much but like you know what happens and that's all you need to know <laughs> and what a disturbing scene what a brutal scene like for 1983 too especially like i can't think of many other movies like from that time period even that has such like young children that are brutally murdered like that like that had to be like some fucking scene like in 1983 when this movie came out damn man it's just disturbing and so mel ends up finding meg dead in the shower and again it's ricky and just, i'll got i'll get him for you meg it's just such a weird i'll i can't stop saying it it's just like why like why does this guy think that ricky is the killer it will never make sense to me if any of you that are watching have an opinion on that or like why he thinks and is so hell-bent on thinking that Ricky is the one doing these killings, please explain it to me. Like, please put it in the comments. Like, please. Because every time I see this movie, it just annoys the living shit out of me. Seeing him constantly just... just, And then when he does later, and I'll get to that. And then so we see... We see this, it's such a weird shot. We see the door open to the girl's cabin and Judy's in there, the camp tramp, camp tramp Judy. And you see the killer 
And it's obviously not Angela. It's Ricky with a wig on. It's so weird. And I think I read years ago that Felissa Rose's parents didn't want her being in, like, the murder scenes and stuff like that. So that's why they had, like, the actor who plays Ricky do this scene. Especially because of how crazy this kill is coming up. But, and that makes sense. But still, I mean, they could have just not showed that shot of the killer. Would have worked fine. You know, or just a POV shot of the killer coming into the cabin and stuff. Like, just the fact that it just looks so stupid. Like, when you see the him standing in the doorway, it's just so obviously Ricky with a wig on. And it just looks so dumb. <laughs> it really looks stupid. But we get my favorite kill in this movie. Which is just brutal, man. And you don't see anything, but just the implications alone. When Judy gets killed by the killer with the pillow, smothering her face with the pillow, and then takes the hot fucking curling iron and just shoves it up her pussy. <laughs> Dude, when I first saw this movie, and I said I was like 12, 13, that shit was so disturbing. <laughs> It's like, Jesus Christ, what the hell am I watching right now? <laughs> my favorite kill in the movie. Even, and I love gore in my slashers, and this has no gore at all and stuff, but like I said, just the implications and lets your mind go to exactly what's happening. What a disturbing kill. Absolutely brutal, absolutely amazing. <laughs> And what an underreaction from Judy. Like, when I know she's being, like, smothered with the pillow. But, like, all she does is, like, you see the shadow of her hands, like, like this. That's it. Like, you have someone smothering you and then sticking a curling iron up your vagina. And all you can do is, like, wiggle your hands around a little bit. I would be kicking and screaming and punching and... <laughs> <laughs> Dude, what an underreaction to the, like to what's happening to her. Like I always laugh at that. Then the counselor with the kids comes back, and uh, like I said, and he finds the little kid's butcher, and I said it, and just brutal for nineteen eighty three. Just such a sick scene, man. Like I can't I couldn't imagine like being that counselor and coming back and finding these young kids butchered like that. Crazy. And Ronnie gets a call about the kids being dead from that counselor and starts announcing the counselors and stuff. There's a killer on the loose and everybody's staying in your cabins. And we have Mel that finally catches up with Ricky and just beats the living shit out of this young kid. And all, <laughs> all I could think about every time I see this is, thank God Ricky lives because the lawsuit <laughs> that they would have against this camp and would absolutely win would be incredible. Like, <laughs> the lawsuit that is guaranteed for them to win. Oh, I just like, I wish I was Ricky getting my ass beaten <laughs> just to win that lawsuit. And Killer ends up shooting Mel in the neck, and he's like, before he gets um, killed and stuff, he's like, it's you, it can't be you, and stuff. And again, like, it's, they don't try at all to hide that Angel is the killer in this movie. But again, it doesn't matter. Like, it's such a great film that it never bothers me, really. I just have to point it out. But he shoot, uh, she shoots Angel, uh, Angel, she shoots Mel in the neck, with an arrow right with in front of the archer range which is the kill we should have got in the first friday the 13th with um oh come on what's her name not darcy not um i can't remember the one that goes in the pouring rain and in front of the archery uh range and stuff and then it just cuts away when and she screams this is what we should have saw in that movie like this is the kill we should have gotten instead of that cutaway in Friday the 13th. And Angela meets Paul and tells him to take his clothes off so they can go swimming. And the cop and the counselor find Ricky like severely beaten and they surprised that he's even alive. And again, a lawsuit, massive lawsuit, <laughs> just absolutely. And this cop, He's in the movie earlier, like I said, when he's talking to Mel and Ronnie about the boy who drowned and stuff, and he has a mustache. 
and it's just a regular mustache, looks fine. And then when we see him at the end of this movie, it's, he has the most ridiculous fake mustache on. It looks like someone just took a Sharpie and just like fucking drew it on his face. It looks so stupid. <laughs> it looks so ridiculous. Like what happened there? I, I need to know. <laughs> I, like I have to know what happened. Did this guy forget that he had another scene to shoot? And he shaved his mustache off and they just said, oh shit, you had a mustache in the scene. Just take this ridiculous looking one that looks nothing like the other one and put it on your face for this last scene. <laughs> like, I have to know what happened. Like, there's got to be a behind the scenes type thing of explaining this because I need a fucking explanation. Like, now. <laughs> After seeing it again just now, I, was, this is, I need to know. Like, I just have to. <laughs> and... We end up having Ronnie and the nice counselor, the girl who's, you know, the, both of them, such sweet people, man. Now, like I said, how they're constantly coming to Angela's defense and trying to help her fit in and everything. And it's the two of them that go to the lake and they hear Angela singing with Paul seemingly like laying in her lap. And then we get the infamous ending. And this ending, the part that disturbs me the most isn't even like you know like the the actual ending like with the shots of angel and stuff with the dick and everything like that it's the ants dialogue like just of her with the, the flashback and stuff and her bringing home angela who we find out is peter and angela was the one who died at the beginning of the movie peter was the one who survived and she ends up being t he ends up being taken in to aunt martha and because she already has a son, Ricky, he, she says two sons won't do. Oh, why, of course it won't. And like, we can't have another boy. No, I've always wanted a little girl. And just like, just the way she like delivers her lines and stuff. And then she says like, Angela, why well, I believe it means angel. Why well, I'm sure it does. And like, just the way she delivered, like I said earlier in like this review, I said that like, I don't know how to describe her character. And I just think that she's like batshit insane and like totally overacts like crazy. But something about her dialogue in that little scene before the very end disturbs the hell out of me man like just the way she says it and like i know you're gonna like that name won't you peter and then he, the kid looks up but then it cuts to the end with just the f infamous face of angela she pops up and pulls severed head falls out of her lap and both ronnie and the the girl counselor are just looking like that can't be it's like gosh she's a boy and you just see that evil looking like grin on her face and it zooms out and she's got a penis and dude what a fucking ending dude <laughs> like what an ending to a movie like i like i said i would kill to go back in time and just be in the theater in 1983 and see everyone react to the end of this movie like you can sort of relive that i guess now by like going on youtube and looking for like ending of sleepaway camp reaction or something like that which i don't like watching reaction like videos at all but to be in the theater and see how everyone was just absolutely blown away by this this ending that nobody's all coming like no one sees this ending coming impossible like it's just so out there and random that like and that's why it's such a famous ending that's why it's, it's infamous. You know, everyone knows the ending to this movie. And it is just absolutely insane. And just her breathing and everything when she's standing there with the creepy-ass grin. And then it just fades to, like, green. The screen just turns green over her face and stuff like that. And that's the end of the movie. And like, dude, what a... What a great slasher film. I've always loved and adored this movie. Even though, like I said, I just picked little stupid things apart through a lot of it. But I absolutely adore Sleepaway Camp. And I, like I said, I love Sleepaway Camp 2 even more. And I will have that up in an hour or two. So I will see you guys soon for Sleepaway Camp 2, Unhappy Campers. Because I'm a happy camper.